Amen. I'm really surprised at how many people came out today. Is it warming up a little bit? That side's the warm side of the church, by the way, in the winter. And that's the cool side of the church in the summer. So uh, anybody want to move if they're really cold? I'll give you a few seconds, minutes, hours. Okay, Chuck's here so we can start. Excellent. Good to have you, Chuck. Let me clean my glasses. So I was driving down the road the other day. And <laughs> I need it. Got any good ones, John? <laughs> <laughs> appreciate that. How'd you like me and Dennis starting that song? <laughs> that was good. Me and Dennis laughed a lot. Hallelujah. Ah, this is just church, isn't it? This is church. If you're visiting, this is just the way it is here. Pretty casual, lay back. It is what it is. We make mistakes. We laugh about it. And then, uh, but then we get in the Word. That's what we do here. We get in the Word. We teach the Word of God. We're going through the book of Luke on Sunday mornings. We're going through the book of Romans on Tuesday nights. So we like going, doing Bible study. Well, I don't know about we, but I like it. I like doing Bible study. What does the Bible say? You know, what does it say? Um, have you ever gone to a Bible study where you sit around with like 10 or 15 people and someone pops open a verse and then they say, well, what do you guys think about this? Yes. I've been to Bible studies like that. I'd rather not know what you think about it. I'd like to know what it says. Yes. Um, uh, if you're going to one of those Bible studies, I don't want to offend you. I mean, sometimes the fellowship is good. You know, the, that's really awesome. But sometimes it can turn into pooling our ignorance, uh, which can be like, you know, let's see what the Bible says. So today we're going to see what the Bible says. In Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 14, where we left off, let's be blessed with the word of God and not what... Pastor Keith thinks it says, praise the Lord. You definitely don't want me to pull my ignorance. I got plenty of it. Hallelujah. Wow. I can't believe how many people showed up. It really amazes me. This is crazy. I figured, I thought maybe me and the band and maybe five people would be in here this morning. Praise the Lord. Even the balcony's got people in it. Yeah, we see you up there. I know you're trying to hide, but we see you. All right. Hallelujah. Verse 14. Lord, bless your word. Anoint it into our hearts. Let it speak to us. Volume, Lord. Lord, I just ask you, please, Lord, get me completely out of the way, Lord. I, I'm your biggest problem, Lord. So, Lord, get me out of the way and let the Holy Spirit reign and rule in our hearts this morning. Let it just rule and reign over your word. Let it rule and reign over everything that's in our midst this morning, that we might be truly surrounded and immersed in the presence of who you are, Lord. Father God, you have told us through your Son that Jesus is the word, that Jesus is the word, that men didn't just come up with this, that the Holy Spirit breathed into them and they wrote the words of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord God, that we have that privilege and that honor this morning to look into your word. That, Lord, we do this without persecution. We do this without any conflict. We are so blessed to live in this nation, Lord. And we do want to lift up this nation, Lord. It's in trouble. It's in trouble, Lord, but... Father, we know greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So, Lord, we ask you, Father God, 
that you would please not only bless your word this morning, but bless our nation that doesn't deserve it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You're, not, you're allowed to ask the Lord to bless our nation, even though it doesn't deserve it. You're allowed to ask. Lord, bless our nation. How many think our nation is going in the right direction? <laughs> not one hand. Wow. Can you imagine if every single person in the United States got radically saved and that every single person in the United States, regardless of creed or anything, got saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, immersed in the Word of God, do you think it would have an effect on the world? It'd be pretty crazy, wouldn't it? Yeah. You walk up to a store and there's like five people running to the door handle. Hey, brother, come on in. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Verse 14. Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went out through all the surrounding region. He returned from where? Being baptized, being tempted. Being filled with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove, going out into the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted. And he returns from all of that. And when he returns to Galilee, he returns in how? What, what, what is he? He's in the power of the Spirit. The power of the Spirit. Now, the Spirit of God is the very thing that raised him from the dead. Do you know that? The Spirit of God is the very thing that actually shook the waters in the beginning when God formed the heavens and the earth. The Spirit of God. It's, it's, the Spirit of God is the, it's the enormous power of the Almighty. And Jesus returns in the power of the Spirit to Galilee and news of him went out through all the surrounding region. So, the news, what is the news of him? Well, we, we know that people have witnessed miracles. We know that people have witnessed the, the Spirit of God descending from heaven, saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. We know that there's this, there's this, this flood of information or news going out of Jesus Christ. Whether they know he's the Christ or whether they know he's a prophet, but... They're excited. And it says in verse 15 that he taught in their synagogues. He taught in their synagogues. Now, it wasn't uncommon for a rabbi to travel to different synagogues and go into the synagogues and be offered the opportunity to read the scriptures. And he taught in their synagogues, but being glorified by how many? Oh, now the Bible tells us that no one ever spoke like him. No one ever spoke like him. No one ever be, was able to convey the scriptures with such authority. Not only authority, but he must have had a way about him. And we'll see that today. He had a way about him. There are some people that can preach the word with authority. And when you leave, you're like, man. I just feel oppressed. I need to repent. I need to sit in sackcloth and ashes. What a loser I am. Now, some people preach with authority like that. Jesus had a way about him. We're going to see that today. And I love Jesus. I do. I love Jesus. Jesus, not just because I'm forgiven or saved, not just because I've got a res reservation in heaven. I love his character. You know, when, when, when John said to send fire down from heaven and smoke them, you know, to, to, you know, let's kill all these sinners. And Jesus said, hey, I didn't come here to destroy them. I came here to save them. And many times in the scripture, you'll see Jesus, Jesus saying, and moved with compassion, he did these wonderful things. And doing these wonderful things, he did them with compassion. He loved us. 
He didn't just love the Jews. He loved us, the world. For God so loved the what? World that he did something about it. He gave his only begotten son that whoever, what? Believes will not perish but have everlasting life. You know, we quote John 3.16, but that verse is gigantic. It's huge. And this is the Jesus that is coming on the scenes. The scene. But I say scenes because he says he was going to the synagogues. Preaching the word. Preaching the word. Verse 16 says, so he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. That's where he grew up, in a little town. Now, back then, Nazareth was a little town. And I, I've said this before, it's a little hillbilly town, a little redneck town. And it's hard to, you know, deal with rednecks. Yeah, they're setting their ways. Generations setting their ways. Yeah, if you're a redneck, don't worry about it. I'm not criticizing you. So don't come up here and punch me. Rednecks. I is one. I love being a redneck. A surfing redneck. But he grows up in this little town where everybody knows everybody. Everybody knows everybody. I, I was thinking yesterday, uh, uh, coming out of Publix, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm running into someone. Hey, how you doing? They know me. And I go, hey, how you doing? And they know me. I go to Ace Harbor. Hey, how you doing? We got a little redneck town. We all know each other. You ever try to go to a store and not see somebody you know? You always run into somebody you know. Not just because you're Pastor Keith, but because there's a little redneck town. And he grows up in this little redneck town, and he's preaching in the synagogues. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, I like this right here. Pay attention to this. As his custom was. Meaning this is what he did. This is what he always did. As his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he stood up to read what? The book. And he found the place where it was written. Now, when it says he stood up to read the book, what does the book mean? The, Bible. the first five books of the Bible. And it also it means the prophets, Isaiah and all the different prophets. And he stands up to read the book. Now, he doesn't just stand up to read like uh, Exodus or Deuteronomy where he could just smoke them all with the word. You know, if you do this, you'll, this will happen to you. And if you do that, that'll happen to you. And if you don't do this, that'll happen to you. And if you don't do that, that'll happen to you. Like the Pharisees were good at. The Pharisees were wonderful at making the people feel less than the Pharisees. You ever hear, uh, you ever hear the term legalist? A legalist. You know what a legalist is? A legalist is someone that uses the word of God to make you feel less superior than the legalist is. That's what a legalist is. It makes them, it makes, they are always looking to elevate themselves over people under them. Jesus was willing to wash their feet. Jesus was willing to wash their filthy, dirty feet. Now, back then, they did not have, you know, hot water running through their water heater in their house and beautiful, nice-smelling, uh, you know, fragrant soaps and nice shampoos and stuff like that. So when, when these guys were sitting around the table, they had filthy feet. Now, what was on the roads back then? Dirt, dust, right? Uh, manure, right? Um, 
Maybe someone got sick along the trail. Uh, whatever was on the road, and I'm sure they, they did walk like this, you know, but sometimes if they got caught up in a conversation, they were like, Ooh. you know, that was pretty common back then. And there they are in the upper room, and Jesus Christ, the King of glory, the creator of the world, kneels down and washes their filthy feet. He wasn't looking to stand on a chair and have them bow before him. So I like Jesus. Why? He loves me. Jesus would wash my feet today. I believe that. He would do that. And not because I'm perfect by any means. He would do that because he loves me. So he took the book and found a place where it was written. Verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, he says. He's reading Isaiah. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Now we know the spirit of the Lord is upon him because back when he was baptized with John the Baptist, the, the spirit of God descended from heaven and landed on him, Right? So he, he, he's reading this scripture that was written hundreds of years ago. And he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to recover and the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Now, Jesus, for the first time in his life on the planet, the first time in his life on the planet are telling the Jews who he is. He's telling them who he is. He's revealing himself to them. The sermon is about him. So why was the anointing upon him. Why was the anointing of God upon Jesus Christ? Why was it upon him? It's very important that you know why the Spirit of God was upon him. I think the text pretty much tells us why the Spirit of God was upon him. To preach what? The good news, the gospel. To who? To the poor. Now, to preach the gospel to the poor in spirit. In spirit. What what does it mean to be poor in spirit? It means to be spiritually bankrupt. It means to be uh, completely depleted of all spiritual resources. It means that you're a spiritual beggar to preach the gospel to the poor. Now, the gospel is the good news. What is the good news? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That is the good news. And that's good news to a spiritual bankrupt person. So he came, Jesus came to preach the good news to the poor. But he also came to heal what? The broken hearted. To heal the broken hearted. Who are the broken hearted? The broken hearted are, well, they're the difficult ones amongst us. Why are they difficult? Because the, when you're broken hearted, you're always trying to heal or comfort or find peace in that feeling of total brokenness, that emptiness, the pain, the suffering that you go through every single day. And why do I say that they're difficult? Because when you run into them, all you hear is about their brokenheartedness. You know, you just, that's, how are you doing today? Well, you know, 
How's it been lately? Well, it's been really hard. They're the brokenhearted. And I say it's difficult because we sometimes can't relate to where they're at. And, and we constantly run into them with the same agenda every time we run into them. But we're not Jesus. And I wish I was like Jesus. Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. To bring the hope that they're, they're needing so desperately. To re, re, relieve them of the deep anxiety and despair that they're going through. A brokenhearted person lives in despair. What does despair mean? It's a lack of hope. A brokenhearted person desperately needs to find something to hold on to. Now, I know this. I'm aware of this. I need more Jesus. I need more Jesus. I need more Jesus. Now, Jesus didn't come to hear their broken story. He came to heal their broken heart. He didn't come to listen to their, their long stories. He came to heal them. Now, we have been given every single power that Christ had. We have the Holy Spirit. Jesus said these things, speaking about all the miracles he did, he said, these things you will do and much more. And what is the much more? Healing the brokenhearted. Leading them to Christ. Leading them deep into Christ. Because that's where the broken heart would get healed. I can't heal a broken heart, but Jesus can. I can't heal, heal a broken heart. I can't fix your broken heart. You can make an appointment to come see Pastor Keith and sit with me for an hour. I can't heal you. I'm incapable. I can't even heal myself. But I know who can. He's come to heal the brokenhearted. That's what he said. I've come to heal the brokenhearted. Why else has he been anointed? Why else has the anointing come upon him? Well, it says, to deliver the captives. To deliver the captives. You know, we can impatiently say to people, you know, why don't you just get your act together? Why don't you just give up that addiction? Why don't you just lay down that, that vice? Why don't you just let go of that? We're good at that, aren't we? He came to deliver the captives. Now, we can... I know we can be impatient with the captives. You know, if they could just get their act together. You know, when Jesus came to me before I ever knew him, before I ever surrendered to him, before I ever chose to make Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of my life, before that ever happened, he came to me. And he came to me to deliver me from my captives. And I wasn't loving him or serving him or praising him at all. But he came to me to set me free. To set me free. He came to do that. I can't set you free, but Jesus can. I can't set you free. Jesus can. I remember May 15th, I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. May 15th. I laid down on the floor and cried. I had real tears coming out of my eyes, filling up my eyes so that I couldn't even see the sponge on the floor. May 15th, surrendered my life to Jesus. I full-blown said, I'm yours. Full-blown. I just gave in all the way, gave in. And I used to, I used to smoke pot. It's called marijuana. I used to smoke it. And I, I said that I would always smoke it. 
I would always smoke it. Now, I don't know why I said that, because every time I smoked it, it made me stupid. But I figured I'd always be stupid. I love being stupid. You ever see someone that smokes pot? They're, like, so stupid. They don't know they're stupid. Actually, when I smoked pot, I thought I was smart. I really did. I believed it. I was like, man, I'm so smart. I'm so creative. <laughs> and people that don't smoke it look at you and go, really? Mm-hmm. You're the most creative person I've ever seen. You're creating stupidness. I used to drink a lot of beer all day long. All day long. I don't mean commode hugging drunk, and I don't mean stumbling. I mean just all day long. On May 15th, I smoked pot and drank beer. I got on my knees. I begged God to forgive me. I begged God to come into my life. I mean, I begged. I was a spiritual beggar. I mean, you would have thought I was begging for food and haven't eaten for 40 years. I was begging him to come into my life. I didn't even know who he was. I said, I don't know if you're real. I don't know if you're out there. I have no clue, but I need you bad in my life. I need something in my life. So when I got off my knees that morning at 9 o'clock, I remember it clearly, I didn't smoke pot ever again. Not that I was going to try to quit. I had zero desire to smoke pot and drink beer all day long. It was gone. He came and set the captive free. He set me free. I mean, I was done. And not because I was trying to be done, not because I was trying to quit this or trying to quit that. It was because the, the master of the universe came into my life because I was dead serious with him. For the first time in my whole life, I got real with God and said, I'd surrender. And he cut the chains off. He cut all the chains off. He set me free. It was like, wow. I didn't know that he was going to set me free. I didn't know anything. I didn't know that my bass playing and bands and the bars around town would turn into me playing bass in a church worshiping Jesus Christ. I didn't know that was going to happen. I didn't know that a guy would, that would never speak in public ever, never, ever would become a pastor. No clue. But he set the captives free. He set me free. Why? So that I could preach the gospel to the poor in spirit. So that I could convey how the Lord is able to set the captives free. How, so I could convince you somehow that Jesus Christ is the only one that could heal your broken heart. He didn't do that for me. He did that for him. The Bible says that all things were created by him and for him. None of that was for me, even though I reaped the benefits. None of that was for me. All of that was for him. And it goes on to say that... Uh, To bring recovery, to recovering sight to the blind. And he, Jesus came to bring sight to the blind. Now we know that he healed blind people when he was on earth, but that's not what he meant when he said that. It was the spiritually blind, those who were incapable of seeing the truth of God's word. He would open their eyes to see it, not only see it, but to believe it. The Bible says that the things of God are foolishness to those who are perishing. It's foolishness. And until he opens your eyes, it's always going to be foolishness. This is always going to be stupid until God opens your eyes. And then you're like, whoa, this is real. This is actually real. See, I said that I got real with God on May 15th. But before May 15th, I had run into a Christian. 
that told me all these unreal things about God. I had, I, he was a Christian. He was a pastor. And I had the privilege and the opportunity to sit with him. It was just something that God ordained. God organized this meeting that I did not plan. It happened on my lunch break. And I figured he's a preacher. He knows the word. And I can ask him any question I want. And he doesn't know me. He doesn't know where to find me. And he can't tell on me. So I'm going to ask him all these questions that bother me. Is it okay to do this? Is it okay to do that? Is it okay if I don't do this? Is it okay if I don't do that? Is it okay if I go here or go there? Is it? I ask him these questions. Every question I asked him, he had the same response. Well, the Bible says, and he'd read a scripture. Another question, well, the Bible says, and he'd read a scripture. And so here we have Jesus Christ anointed to talk to me. See, he was reading the scriptures. The Bible declares that Jesus is the word, that the scriptures are Jesus. He speaks through the word. And here is this preacher speaking the word into my heart. Well, once that word got in there and started to settle in and started growing roots in my heart, that's when I couldn't live that way anymore. That's when I fell on my face and begged the king of glory to come into my heart. And he did. Now, there are other things he fixed and other things he rearranged. The beautiful thing about Jesus, when he comes into your life, and he moves in. See, when you believe in Jesus and you trust in him as your Lord and Savior, the Spirit of God comes into you and lives there. And one of the things that I didn't know when I made this commitment was he starts moving the furniture. He starts cleaning out rooms that I wanted to keep, you know, can we not go in that room? I got some treasures in there. No, we're, re we're doing everything new. And I'm like saying, well, can't we just rebuild this over here? We can just put a new roof on that one over there? No. You know what, Keith? We got to tear the whole house down. And we got to build a whole new one. Yep. Everything's got to go. Well, can I just keep this and bring it into the house? No. That's got to go to the dump. Everything's got to go. We got to start all new. And that's a process. That's a process, isn't it? I mean, I'm still finding closets that I haven't emptied yet. And he's like, we, we have to get rid of that one too? Yeah, that's got to go too. Don't worry, Keith. We got the rest of your life to work on this. But we'll get there. Because the day you depart, I'll have you perfect. You'll be just like me. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <sighs> Recovery of sight to the blind. Hmm. Set at liberty those who are what? Bruised. Do you know something about bruised people? There's some in here. There has to be in this, um, this amount of people gathered. There has to be some bru bruised people. The thing about bruised people are they're timid and fearful. Why are they timid and fearful? Because people have hurt them. They've been wounded. They're bruised. They have scars that they carry. And those scars and those bruises make them timid and fearful of being hurt again. And these people that are bruised, they've found coping mechanisms to deal with life. And some of those coping mechanisms are walls, boundaries, borders. And it helps them to cope 
through a life that has hurt them and wounded them and bruised them. But he came to, to set at liberty those who have been bruised. I can't help you with your scars, but I know who can. The same one that helped me. And he will help you because it's his desire to help you. It is his passion to love you. It's his, it's his passion to comfort the brokenhearted, to heal up their wounds. In verse 19, he goes on to say, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus came to proclaim that now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow. If you're here today and you're hearing this and you know for sure that you never, ever got down and begged God to come into your life and heal you, to forgive you, to cleanse you, to purify you, and to prepare you for an eternal position in heaven, if you know that's a fact, if you know that what you believe isn't what you really believe and you want to believe today. He came to set you free. Today's the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time, not tomorrow. Why put off till tomorrow what you can accomplish today in having a whole new life? Don't be afraid just dive in. You don't know where he's going to take you, honestly. You have no idea where he'll take you. I know that's scary. Nobody warned me when I got saved. Nobody said, this is going to happen to you, Keith, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now. This is what's going to happen. Nobody warned me. But I'll tell you what, the whole road was glorious. The whole journey was amazing. The people that I have run into my life the opportunities that I've been blessed with is incredible. There is no downer life for a believer. It's all glorious. It's all glorious. If you haven't made that decision, what are you thinking? It's free. Don't you like free stuff? I love free stuff. It's free. You don't have to pay a dime. You do have to surrender your body, though. You do have to let go of all control. You do have to be, stop being the boss of your life. I mean, I guess there are some things you got to do. But then he's so much better at running your life than you are. How are you doing? You doing a good job? Yeah, how's it working for you? Yeah, exactly. He can handle this. He is God after all. Surrender. Verse 20 says, and then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. Why would they be fixed on him? Because rabbis don't typically get up and tell you how to be comforted and that you will be comforted and you will be set free and you will be able to have your spirit re rejoiced and recovered. They're used to being talked down to and they're used to having the word of God trample on them, put them in bondage, tell them what to do and what not to do and, and telling them that they don't measure up. And here comes this rabbi giving them good news, nice news. And I'm sure that Jesus did a way better job at this than I'm doing. Can you imagine the way he spoke? The way he opened the scriptures? Wow. It says that Jesus was full of mercy and truth. And grace and compassion and love. Can you imagine hearing him preach this? And their eyes were fixed on him, verse 21, and he began to say to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. 
Who? What is he saying? What is he saying? I don't know. What do you think he's saying? Can you imagine all the mumbling going on? Is he saying he's, he's a Messiah? I don't know. What do you think he's saying? I don't know. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? Now, don't forget he's back in his hillbilly town. And everybody knows him. And he's preaching like this. He's speaking like this. And they're like, isn't this like that carpenter's kid? And you know he's not all pious, all dressed up like a Pharisee. You know, he's just wearing his robe and flip-flops. He said to them, verse 23, you will surely say this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Heal yourself. Remember when they they yelled at Jesus hanging on the cross and they said, if you are the son of God, why don't you bring yourself down from there? Why don't you heal yourself? Verse 24, then he said, Assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the day of Elijah. When the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and there was, and there was a great famine throughout all the land, but no one, not one, of, and, but to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. Let me continue. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except for Nahum, the Syrian. Verse 28, so all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. Why would they be filled with wrath just hearing that? He's just telling them about the scriptures. This is what the Bible says. Why why are they all upset? I'll tell you why they're upset. Because in both situations with Elijah and Elisha, both situations, God didn't send them to the Jews. He sent them to Gentiles. He had them in the palm of his hand when he was speaking sugar and honey. But then when he says, you guys, if you don't be careful, if you don't watch out, God's going to send this treasure to the Gentiles. Now they're all angry. Verse 39 says that they rose up and thrust him out of the city. And they led him to the brow of the hill on which the city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. Isn't it quickly, isn't it amazing how quickly they marvel and then kill him? Remember when he was coming down the hill into Jerusalem on the donkey, they were praising him. Hosanna in the highest. And the very next day they were saying, crucify him. Hmm. Verse 30, then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. We'll finish the rest up next week. But it's amazing how people are. This Jesus came to love on us, period. That's why he came. He wasn't looking to get anything out of us. He was only looking to give something to us. He didn't want anything from us. He wanted to give something to us. And all people do is constantly, for all generations to this present day, is hate Jesus. The one who just wanted to heal the brokenhearted, to bring sight to the spiritually blind, to set free the captives. And preach the good news to the spiritually poor. He came to love us. 
and for that he's hated. And if you are ever going to make a decision to choose to worship the King of glory, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, today is the day. Quit putting it off. Quit it. He loves you. He just wants to marry you and live with you forever. He just wants to marry you. He's in love with you. Can't you just say, I will? Can't you just let him into your heart today? Can't you just receive the blessing he wants to give you today? Can you not just open your heart up to the mercy that he, he hands you today, the grace he wishes to pour out on you today? Choose today whom you will serve, the Bible says. Choose you this day whom you will serve. That's what the Bible says. Not, not tomorrow. This day whom you will serve. So before we hit the closing song, if you would like to truly make a public confession of your faith in Christ and re give your life to Jesus this morning, Put your hand as high in the air as you can reach and say, I would like this day to be my day. Amen. 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 Praise God. Anyone else? Choose you this day. Put your hand up. Don't be weird. It's weird not to receive a gift like this. Put your hand up. If you're feeling it, if God is speaking to your heart, stick your hand in the air and say, yes, that's me. Praise God. I see your hand. Amen. You can put it down. God bless you. God bless you. I got another question for you. If you're a Christian and you have wandered away from the throne and you want to renew your faith, rededicate your life and make a new commitment to Christ, and this morning you feel like God has moved you, would you just slip your hand up also? Amen. Amen. I'm putting my hand up. Amen. Amen. And if you're, last question, if you're perfect and have no need of a, a fresh anointing on your life, and if you have no need to draw closer to the throne, would you please raise your hand? Very good. How you liking church, guys? I'm liking church. I like church. I like church. Well, we're going to close with a song, so let's uh, lift our voices to Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, we thank you. Lord, I lift up those who have made these commitments this morning to uh, not only draw closer to you and have a new life in you, Lord, but those who want to make a fresh start, a new beginning, to renew their faith to uh, allow you to come into their lives and do a new thing for a new season. Lord, we thank you so much for all that you do, all that you are. We thank you, Lord God, for the simplicity of what it is to be a Christian, Lord. I love you. We love you, Lord. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.